Good morning, everybody. Come on in the room. Welcome to New Hope Fellowship. Thank you for joining us online. Hey. <laughs> all right. Let's all stand. We're going to worship together. turned into wine open the eyes of the blind there's no one like you none like you and into the darkness into the darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you there's none like you our God sing it out God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, yeah. I sing water, you turn to wine. Water turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. There's none like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. There's none like you.
sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will
Keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and day? again just who I am because I need to know Team. Hello, good morning, church. You can be. I love that song. It's so good. Um, well, good morning, everyone. It's not very often that you get both Mr. and Mrs. Michael Good on the stage today. So, um, <laughs> yeah. A couple. Thank you to everyone who has been helping out with the um, children's ministry. It's really along back there. Um, the renovation has been a huge project, and there's been so many people who have 
given their time, their energy, their funding. We just, we can't thank you enough. Um, when I took on this position as the director of the children's ministry, I had no idea that we were going to do such a big renovation. And I feel like this is setting the stage. This is giving us a new direction for that ministry and really what God wants to do with it. A um, couple weeks ago when we first started, I took all of the kids back there and I asked them what they wanted to pray for, what they wanted that ministry to reflect. And something that stood out to me was specifically these kids, you know, from ages 5 to all the way up to Nicole, 15, 14, 15. Um, they wanted it to be a safe place that could give a light, specifically a gold light. That was a Coleman boy who um, specifically wanted it to be a gold light. And I agree. Um, I think that that ministry, that place back there is going to, to reflect that light, to build up these kids who are going to be the light of our world. That's what they're learning about today back there. Um, and I just look at all of them and their little faces, and they are going to be the future of our church here. And so everything that you have put into that ministry, that space back there to create that is just, oh, it warms your heart. So make me a little emotional. Um, next up, I just wanted to let you guys know that July 12th through 14th is going to be our summer camp for our junior high and high school kids. Um, a lot of you don't really get to see what my because he does it outside of regular church hours. So he connects with kids in our county, in our community. Um, and we, we've built this ministry, a safe place for them to come and just be who they are. And um, props to you, Michael, for doing that because it's just incredible to see. So we are going to do a summer camp this year. Last year it got canceled due to COVID, so we held it in our yard. Um, <laughs> that was interesting. Uh, this year we decided to do something a little bit and be in Camptonville. Uh, and we are going to take them all on this camping trip. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, so just keep an eye out for information, uh, for, for about it. Um, and there's going to be opportunities to, to help support and, and give for that, that mission as well. So we're really excited about that coming up in July. Uh, so for just supporting both the children's ministry and the high school junior high ministry. So as we continue to worship through giving, I also wanted to talk a little bit about what God can do when we give. There's a reoccurring theme in the Bible that talks about planting seeds, growing crops, you know, reaping, um, reaping what you sow. Uh, for me, I can't keep a succulent alive. So um, if you're like me, sometimes that can be a little bit tricky. It sounds easy. Okay, you plant the seed and then it grows. Uh, but for some of us, it might not be so easy. God is the one in charge. He can take whatever we are giving and turn it into fruit. He can produce life. He can multiply through his word. So Mark chapter four, 14 through 20 says the farmer sows the word. Some people are like seeds along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes it away and, and takes away the word that was sown to them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But then they have no roots. They last only a short time. Doesn't that, that's, I hate it when that happens. So it's like, okay, God, ready to go. You know, I'm super joyful. And then all of a sudden, and it rips it out. I can't, uh, frustrating that cool. Um, when trouble or persecution comes of, because of the word, they fall quickly away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the, di the desires for others come in, choke the word, making it hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some, some, what was sown? I have seen God make a way when there is no way. I've witnessed what can be done when we just say yes to his plan. 
anything worth doing deserves consistency. I believe that when we talk about giving as well. When we give consistently, we don't give up because Satan takes it from us or our roots are not strong, even when we're persecuted or when we are among thorns. We've all been there. When we give consistently, God will make a way. It is not always easy. Sometimes it doesn't turn out how we thought it would. Can I get an amen on that? Okay, thank you. But God's promise is strong, and God's promise is alive. I truly believe that. He's alive. It's growing. Thank you, God, (laughs) that you're the farmer. You're attending to the soil of our souls, and you're allowing us to grow more than ever before. You're taking our tithes and our offerings and stretching them in ways that's impossible. It's only possible with you. Like a seed being covered in dirt, trampled on, forgotten in some cases, you can produce more than ever imaginable. God, thank you so much for this. Thank you for the faithfulness, the people that show up, God, the people that give, people that give their time, their talents, their time. I just pray that you take everything that we have to offer. It is yours. You are welcome in this place, and we are giving it to you. Be with Michael today as he preaches your word. I pray that you just use him as your vessel, Lord. Open our hearts. Prepare us for what's next as we grow and grow closer to you. Amen. If you're ready to give online, information for the Tidely app will be in the comment section. And if you're here in person today, there will be ushers at the door to receive your tithes and offerings when you leave. So, thank you. All right. Well, she should give the sermon, not me. I don't know what. That was, uh, that was something else, talking about gold lights. I don't have that prayer prepared for today. Well, welcome church. Welcome family. Uh, welcome online. Um, if you don't know me, um, it's probably because I haven't been here in a couple Sundays, but I'm Michael. I'm our youth pastor, and um, I have been away for, gosh, it feels like forever. Um, I'm in my internship to become a paramedic, and so I haven't been able to m- make the last, gosh, 12, 13 Sundays, um, and I've definitely missed it. So it feels so good just to be here, to be present, to be with you. I'm super excited for for what we have in store. Don't mind me. I'm going to be looking at this a lot today because I'm really bad at memorizing things and remembering. I can't even remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. So I'm going to look at this often as I kind of go through everything. Um, But before I do that, let me just pray over this message and pray over you guys because I think... It's one thing for me to stand up here and, and speak, but it's another for you guys to hear what God wants us to hear, okay? So if you can bow your heads with me. Dear Lord, just thank you so much for the opportunity to be, to be present here, to be in this building, to hear your word, Lord God, and, and just to, to hear what you want us to hear, Lord God. I pray that everyone in this room, as we're all in different situations, we're all struggling with something, or, or maybe we're not struggling, but we're lost. Who knows what it is, Lord? But you have a message, Father God, and I pray that you use me, use me as a vessel, as a tool, Lord, so that I can give out your word, Father, and as everyone in this room and online is, is hearing it, Father, I pray that you, you prepare the message for each person individually because everyone's going to get something different out of the message, God. And I pray that what they get is what you want for them specifically today, Lord, in their life. So I just thank you for the opportunity. I thank you for this beautiful Sunday in this church and this family that we have, Lord God. In your name, amen. So first thing, I'm just going to put it out on the table, is I am not a teacher. In, in fact, I probably had more issues with teachers in my life than I had the fun times. Um, specifically in school, I was rambunctious and loud and in detention often. Um, because of that, I was just a little immature for my age. I'm sure my wife would say the same now. Um, but I think I've matured a little bit. Um, but essentially... Um, Being a teacher is not my forte. So what I want to do today is I want to explore with you um, a concept, an idea. Because what I often tell the youth 
and at our youth group when we meet is, is Jesus was a teacher. He was actually many things. He was the son of God. He was a teacher. He was a carpenter. But I also think um, one of the biggest things that often gets overlooked is Jesus was an example. He was the best example of what we can have as humans to be human. If you look at what he did, it can outline what we are supposed to do. Yes, he did preach and he, and he spoke, but it's one thing to speak and it's another thing to do. And so what I want to do is I want to explore that concept of doing with you. And I don't want to teach you today because you won't learn anything from me, guaranteed. So what I want to explore with you today, that's kind of like my, my term of the day is explore. I want to explore the idea of identity because our identity shapes everything in our life. In fact, Pastor is going to be speaking on transformation for the next several weeks. And what, it, that, what that means is you got to come from something to transform into another thing. And if you don't know where you're coming from, then how do you really transform into something better if you don't know where you're at in the first place? So I want to explore the idea of identity because it's really a hot topic nowadays. Identity is tough who we are, what we are, what we're supposed to like, what we're supposed to do. It's all under attack right now. And we live in a really tough time. And I know you, I, I think I've heard that from every generation of person that I've spoken with. Oh, when I was a kid, it was so rough. Or when I had, the, when, when I was growing up, it was rough. But we live in a different rough right now. The rough we live in is, is plagued by what we have at our fingertips. We have technology, right? And so we have, everyone has a phone. I think I met like a six-year-old the other day that had a phone, and I'm like, that is nuts. And what does he have access to? There's the news. There's social media. And you can't even keep up with how many of them there are. I think I have two, and there's like, I, I can't keep up. It's just, it's not going to happen. And so they have access to that. And what does that mean? It means that, that they have influence here and influence there and censorship over here and cancel culture over here and you have to believe this because if you don't believe this then you're wrong and it's just tough it's a tough time and so what I want to do is I want to read out of the Bible I want to see what the Bible says about identity because I know what the world says and I know what the world wants and what we should do according to the world and what we shouldn't do according to people and so if you have a Bible follow along with me today and if you don't have a Bible um, and you have your cell phone, as much as I was just trash talking on cell phones, you know, there's, there's good things with cell phones, right? There's a Bible app. You can follow along in the Bible. Um, I'm going to have the verses today. I'm not going to have a lot because it's just not what I'm doing today. But they'll be up on the slide. We only have one projector working right now. I apologize for that. Um, we're working on it. But it'll be on the, on the projector there. Um, and then I'll also read it out loud so you guys can see it. And if you're following along, it should be on a slide there too. But we really, in order to understand and explore identity, what we need to do is we need to figure out what did the Bible say about it. And the cool thing about the Bible is the first time it mentions identity, it's in the very beginning. It's at the very start. It's in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. And it's in chapter one, the first chapter. So God said, I want identity to be outlined from the very beginning. And it says this. It says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it's the first time that, that the term people or our existence as humans comes into the picture and it outlines identity from the very beginning. It says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so that's it. That's my message. It's outlined right there. We are made in his image. There's no other answer. It's just done. So we could all go to lunch now, and that was it, right? How, how can you just differ from that? It's, it's outlined. It's in the first chapter of the Bible. We're made in his image. And what, are, what better image is there other than God's image? There's not, right? So it's just simple. It's right there. There's nothing that can be confused about it. 
So the issue that I have is, then why is the, the term identity, and why do we struggle with it right now in life? Why is, I, is identity such a hot topic? Well, the issue with identity is that it's always been under attack from the very beginning. So if that was Genesis chapter 1 and God outlined identity, well, let's look at the first time that identity was actually under attack in the Bible. It's only two chapters later, and it's with Adam and Eve. It's in the Adam and Eve story. The enemy, in this case the serpent, comes and he says, he, he challenges Eve on the term of identity, and it says this. It says, the serpent was... Oh, I have a different version here, so I'm going to read this one. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said, Eve said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, the middle of the garden, God had said, you shall not eat from it, because if you shall touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die. Listen, you're fine. It's going to be all right. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That was the first, attack of, the first attack on identity in the Bible. And it was a lie. It was a lie from the very beginning. Okay? God gave us our identity. We were already made in his image. It said that in the first chapter. We're made in his image, and then the serpent comes along and he says, he says well, if you want to be like God, then you got to do this. You should do this. Don't listen to God. Do this. Okay? So he, he came in from the very beginning. He came in and he confused Eve and Adam and told them what they should do. So I want to look out here and I want to see a show of hands of how many people are tired of being told what they should and shouldn't do because I am tired of it. I really am. You see, we are influenced from a very young age on what we should and what we shouldn't do. We give power to the people in regards to what, what can influence us. Instead of allowing God to, to give us the authority to influence ourselves based off of God's will. Okay? People are given all of the power. Or at least we give them all the power. And we think that, that people can do a lot of things in our life. That we need people. And we do. The social aspect of, of people is, is such a great thing. But we give them too much. We say that people can take us to where we need to go. People can give us provision. People can tell us who we are. People can give us a purpose. People can set our parameters. But that's not true. There's only one person who can, one being that can, will, and has, and that is God. God gives us all of those things. So I want to show you something, because I'm a visual person. I can stand up here and talk, but I'll just ramble on and on and on, and I'm sure everyone that really knows me knows that I do that. So I'm going to show you something, and, and so what I'm going to do is I want you to think about the relationships that you have in your life. Think about the people that you come in contact with on a daily basis from when you were younger all the way until now, okay? So I'm going to grab some things over here. Again, I'm Mr. Visual, and it's going to help me out a lot, right? So remember, we're thinking about all of the different things in our life, all the different people and how they influenced us. So the little, this, is a, this is a ping pong ball. I love ping pong. It's one of my favorite sports. You don't have to be tall to be good at ping pong. And so I, I, I like ping pong. Um, but this is a ping pong ball, and it's orange. So imagine that this orange ping pong ball is a person or in an opinion that they're giving you in your life, okay? And so for, the most, for most of us, our sense of identity is really formed in school. It's kind of once you hit that school age and you join in kindergarten, you're starting to be around other kids and you're starting to see what they like and then all of a sudden you start liking what they like because they like it and you want to befriend them. And, and that's where identity really comes into, to, into place. And this here, this, this little whatever this is, container, it's going to be our vessel. It's going to be us, right? This is, 
who we believe we are. And so as we're in school, peers in our school, they're going to start making comments, right? They're going to say like, oh, you're wearing those jeans? Those aren't the cool jeans. And so there's their, their opinion right there. It goes, it goes into your, your, your vessel, your, your identity. And they say other things like, like well, well, you should play tag with me and you shouldn't play with Betty because Betty's mean. Or, or they say, you need to do this or you need to do that. And all of a sudden they start filling this up. Maybe your teacher says, you know, well, you learn a little funny, so, so there, you need to, like, do it this way. And maybe you have a, a brother, right? We all, some of us have brothers. And maybe your brother picks on you. Or maybe you have a sister and your sister picks on you because they're, they're having issues with their own identity and they need to take it out on you, right? I have that with my son. My son loves to, in, you know, instigate issues with his sister. Maybe you have, like, a whole family. You're like the Coleman family and they're all in there, right? You know? So you get all these things, all these opinions, right? And they're not, <laughs> they're not necessarily bad. They're just, they're there. And then you grow up a little bit, right? You're getting into high school, and, and you're thinking about colleges, and then people say, well, you need to go to that college, because that's the better college. You need to go to this one, right? Or maybe, maybe it's you need to be around these people. You shouldn't like this type of genre of music, because that, that's not popular. That's not on the radio. You can't like that. You need to like this. And all of a sudden, you start filling these up over and over. And they say, if you really want to succeed, you need to do this. And as you see, we're, we're slowly starting to fill up. And then, and then you become an adult. And you turn 18. And that's a big moment in life, right? It's a huge moment in life. Because when you're 18, there's like this expectation that you need to have life figured out. The second you turn it, you're not a kid anymore. You need to just have everything planned out. You're 18. You need to have this when you're 18, this when you're 19, 20, 21, 22. By the time you're 25, you start having all these plans and these ideas that you have to have. Like, well, I got to have a house by the time I'm 25 because if not, I'm a failure. I need to be driving this type of car because that's what you do. I need to have this kid. Maybe I need to have these many kids. Like, you have all of these opinions, and slowly, over time, you start having all these things, and you get more and more people, and these more and more people, they start having opinions, and then you start filling up like this, and sometimes people leave your life, right? And they, they just, they go away, right? For whatever reason. And then you're filled up. And this is now who you are, right here. This is your vessel, okay? This is, this is you. This is what defines you, opinions. And there's, there's nothing more that can be filled up because it's there, okay? And this, this is who you are. But let's look at what the Bible says about this, right? Because we, we know what the world says and what the world wants, but what does the Bible say about this? It says this in, in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says this. It says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And you know what I love about that verse? Within that verse, it says nothing about what we should or what we shouldn't do. It simply says the opposite. There's no pressure. It says that God has already given us everything we need. There's no stipulation there. You don't have to do this or have to do this. It says, you just need to know God. And if you know God, then he's going to give you everything you need. You don't need to like this type of music in order to live a godly life. You don't need to have this type of car or have 75 children. You, 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 just, you have to have a relationship with God. It says, by coming to know him, you can have a godly life. So how do we do that? How do we come to know God? Right? Because that's, that's a hard question. That could be a tricky question. Well, I think there's three answers. Right? But we're going to explore this. Right? Because I'm not a teacher. Let's explore. Here's what I think. I think we, get, we know somebody, especially God, by getting into his word. Right? Because that's his living word. That's what we hear. It's living. It, can, it influences our lives. So we get into his word and we can read what he wants for us. By prayer, by speaking with him. I don't know about you guys, but I can't have a relationship with somebody that I don't talk to. 
So we need to pray. We need to have a conversation with God daily and by serving others. So we're talking about identity, right? So how does identity get impacted by serving other people? Well, if you focus everything about yourself, who you are is, it's, it's not really outlined because you're just, you're looking inward. But when you give yourself to others and you serve, maybe in a ministry, maybe in a small group, maybe it doesn't even have to be in a church. You just serve other people. You are going to find yourself faster than you can when you just look at your inward qualities and you look at yourself. So those are the three things that we start doing, right? And as we do those things, God will start filling in the spaces in our life, the issues. And so if we look at this, remember, this is, this is who we believe we are. And it looks really full from afar. But you really, if you really get close and you look and you're like, well, there's a little bit of empty space right there. And there's some space right there. And you realize that this is just a bunch of lies. It's just stuff. Things that, that it seems like we're full from the outside, but on the inside we're actually, there's a lot of dead space. And so what do we do in order to correct that? We need to, we need to be a part and have a relationship with God. We need to have his living water in our lives. And when we have a relationship with him, we start seeing changes. Put this in here so I don't get the carpet all wet. But, but we start seeing as, as, as we do these three things, right? Maybe, maybe we pray. Maybe we say, all right, God, I'm going to start. I need to have a relationship with you, right? Because I heard from Michael at, at church that if I have a relationship with you, well, maybe I can get rid of this ping pong ball because it doesn't treat me very well, right? So then we, what we do is, is we start pouring in and we pray. We pray a little bit, right? Most of the time it's, we pray when we need something. Right? I've fallen into that trap like, oh man, this really sucked. I need this right now. Jesus, I'm going to pray. I know I haven't prayed in like three weeks, but, but I'm going to pray because I really need this right now. And we pray. You know, and, and God, God knows. God loves us, right? And so, so we pray, and then, and then maybe we, start, we open our Bible, and we start going to church. And so you know what happens is, is on Sundays, everything feels good. It feels like we're refreshed. Oh, I hear that message was so good. And we're so refreshed and, and we're feeling like, like juicy, right? Because we got God's living water. He just poured it all over us. And, and then the rest of the week, we're kind of dry, right? All these opinions and these people, they're still in our lives. They're still here, you know? You know, I, I, I've said this before, and I used to be this type of Christian. And, and I, I don't like talking about it, but I do because... It's powerful to me. I used to be a Christian that would party on a Saturday night, but go to church on a Sunday morning and act like nothing happened the previous night. Okay? And, and that's not a healthy way to live. That's pouring in a little bit of God when I need it and then letting the rest just settle there and I, I keep everything in, right? So... So what happens when we begin to do this daily, though, when we start building a routine, when we start praying every single day? We pray every single day. We go to church. We open our Bible. Maybe we join, we join a ministry, and then we keep filling up. And then, oh, some of these things that have been a pest in our lives that have really affected us, you start seeing them get pushed out, Right? And then sometimes they go really far away and you're okay with it. Okay? But, but what happens when you do that is you feel really good. And, and some of these things, these burdens, they get lifted off your shoulders. And, and it feels good. And, and then you just stop. Right? Because I've been there. And when you stop, you still got some issues. But it's like, but you still got some Jesus too. Right? You're, you're lukewarm. You're really lukewarm. And, and you say, oh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep that just because the world says I should have that. And, but, I, but God is good, right? God is really good. I got God right here, but I still got these other things that other people said. But God is good, so everything in my life is, is great. Right? Lukewarm. That's what that is. That's lukewarm. 
So then when we're lukewarm, you live this, this balancing act where, where you're trying to, to live this double life and, and your identity isn't, isn't who you are. Your identity, you have two. I couldn't keep up with the first one. How am I going to keep up with two now? And so, so you start praying and you say, well, God, I need something else. I need, I need, to, I need to fix this. So what do we do? We keep going to church. We do these three things. We keep going to church. We keep reading his word. We keep filling ourselves, right? And then as you see, we start letting God run our life over until the fact that he pours more than we could ever imagine here until we are done. And then you just kick those out, just like that. Right? And this is us, because let me tell you, when this thing was half full before, and you had some water, and you, had, you still had some of these opinions and these, these you should and shouldn'ts in your life, if I was to take it to one side of the room and go to the other, what would you see? You'd see, you'd st- you, you might not even know water was at the bottom, because all you would see from afar is these orange balls, those opinions. Those should, those shouldn'ts, because they'd be floating at the top, and well, water's clear, and so, so it, it wouldn't be. It, people wouldn't even know that you have a relationship with God because all they see is those orange balls, right? So this is the fastest message that I've ever done. I feel like I feel like it's it's sped up, but I it, it works for the youth. So I I was hoping it was working for you, but let me tell you something. I want to close with this, and then they're gonna they're gonna. They're going to come up here and do another song. But, but the best part about this whole thing, right? Because it's, it's, it's very simple. Do those three things. Do them regularly. And God will start giving you an identity. And, and does that mean that we're going to escape these orange balls? No, it doesn't. There's still going to be people in our lives that tell you what you should and what you shouldn't do. But the best part about all of this, about this visualization, is that when these lies and these opinions and these shoulds and shouldn'ts, they come back into your life and they come back and they try to fill your vessel, they're just on the surface. They can't, they can't get pushed down because the second they do, God just pushes them right back up to the top again. Because you're filled with God's living water because you have a relationship with him and it matters. And that is who you are. You were born anew with his living water and opinions don't matter anymore. They're just, they're just opinions. They're shoulds. They're shouldn'ts. So I'm going to pray and then as I pray, the, the worship team is going to come back up here and they're going to do another song. But I just thank you so much for, for hearing me out talking about identity, and uh, I'm excited to see what Pastor has about transformation now that we know what, what we have and what God calls us to do to find ourselves. So if you can bow your heads with me. Dear God, I just I want to say thank you so much for using me today, for presenting the word in a way that to me made sense something that I can see in action. I can see, Lord God, that when you pour over us, Father God, that all those distractions and those issues and the, and the should and the shouldn'ts, they get pushed out, Lord, because we don't need those. Those aren't us. Those are just opinions. So thank you for, for overflowing with us, Lord God. And I pray that everyone in this room, everyone online watching, Lord God, that they can just build a relationship with you. And let it start today if if they need it to. Let them continue today if they're already on that journey, Lord God. And let them just be with you daily. Feel what you have to offer them on the daily, Lord God. Whether that be through prayer, through a ministry that they join, through uh, reading your word and, and, and learning from it, Lord God. Just thank you so much for the ability for us to do that. I pray that everyone has a great rest of the day, that we, that we can just be merry and, and enjoy the, the views and the sights and the experiences that you have for us today, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Thank you.
Great job, Michael. Let's all stand together. Have a great week, church. We love you. We'll see you next Sunday.